Hi everyone and welcome to this potted version of Understanding Creativity. So creative people can often get a label as being rather dramatic or over-emotional, hypersensitive, um, but obviously creativity is a fundament, fundamental part of being an artist, being a performer. Um, so is there a biological basis for creativity and can it explain some of these traits that we tend to you know label onto creative people well this is something i was very interested in so i created uh this talk and did some research into this and um here are some of the things that i found so it's we're looking at really that argument of nature versus nurture. Are you born creative? Is it inevitable? Is it somehow genetic? Or is it something that is um, that happens because of your experiences in life? Is it a more a behavioral thing? Um, and the, the answer is in the literature, this, it's really a combination of the two. But when we talk about cre creativity, what do we really mean? Well, if you look at some of the um, sort of research definitions of creativity, how they define that term, uh, it's the capacity for divergent thought. So this is the ability to think outside the box, right? To look at things a different way from a different perspective and also to be able to hold many different streams of thought in your mind at one point you know having a conversation with a creative person can often you find yourself jumping right oh we're talking about this oh no there's this and there's that and then you know this sort of non sequiturs it's actually because creative people have have lots of strands going on at once this is in uh, contrast to convergent thought, which is the ability to focus on a narrow task, right? So that you can really zoom in on something without being distracted by the world around you. But if you're anything like me, you know, I find that quite hard because I'm always like, oh, what was that? What was that? And then my thoughts are running off somewhere else. So that's divergent thought. Now, if we look at the brain and look at the anatomy of the brain, one of those things that we've colloquially always talked about is the right brain, left brain argument. Oh, creative people are right brained people and people who are more kind of logical reasoning people are left brain people. And that's really a, a sort of gross oversimpl oversimplification of brain anatomy. But yes, there are traits. The left side of our brain does tend to deal with more logical, linear thinking. It likes to label things and structure things, whereas the right side of the brain is more about expressivity and more about metaphor rather than logic. Um, so yes, there are those characteristics, but like anything in the body, one thing's just not happening in one place. It requires both sides of the brain uh, to operate that. What we also know about the right and left sides of the brain, known as the hemispheres. So the left hemisphere controls the movement of the right side of the body and vice versa. The right side controls the left side. So if you get a brain injury on the left, you often will lose uh, motor function on the right. OK, so we have this kind of crossover going on. And the part of the brain that does that crossover that sits between those two hemispheres is known as the corpus callosum. Now, um, this is so this is the area that's essentially uh, handling the crosstalk that goes from one side of the brain to the other. And any task we do requires this interaction of both sides of the brain. Um, so there's a research uh, paper that I found and, and uh, the, the reference is down there on the slide um, that showed that musicians and they were looking at musicians who began their training before the age of six. So when we're looking at brain development, then um, obviously when you're a child, there's a lot of brain development going on. So if they began playing their area before the age of, uh, began playing their instrument before the age of six, they had an increased corpus callosum size. So the brain is like anything else in the body. If you do 50 bicep curls a day, you're going to get bigger bicep muscles. If there's a lot of traffic going through a particular area of the brain, it builds itself up uh, in response to that. It becomes bigger. So 
the corpus colossum of musicians who began training before the age of six is larger than those who didn't uh, train in music from an early age. So what that shows is that there has to be a lot of cross activity going on. Now that could be because as we talked about right and left sides of the body, playing an instrument re requires a lot of coordination between both sides, particularly for instruments like string instruments where both hands are doing completely different things. But also it might be because we're moving between the left hemisphere thinking, which is more about technique. So when we're training and really kind of nailing down our technique, that's more a left brain function or left brain dominant function. And then when we're in performance in, in kind of expression, artistic expression mode, that's more of a right hemisphere dominant function. So again, there may be more of this crosstalk going on between the two sides of the brain. So we actually have structural differences there in the brain, but that's in how the brain has developed. But let's look at now um, some research that looked at um, the structure of the brain that is kind of innate, that, that you're born with. And what they were looking at in this study was creative individuals, and they were looking at an area of the brain called the thalamus. And if you look on the very right hand side of this slide, you'll see three words there. And the middle one says thalamus. You can follow the arrow and see where that is in the brain. But essentially, the thalamus is the part of the brain that filters the signals from our environment. So at any given moment, we've got uh, visual information coming in, we're hearing things, we can smell, we can taste, we've got temperature information. So all that sensory information is coming into the brain. And if we weren't able to filter it, then we would be overwhelmed, right? So the thalamus kind of acts as a filter to dial down some of that noise so that we can focus on a narrow task that you can walk down say a busy street when there's all this kind of noise and kerfuffle going on around you and, and not sort of lose focus right but in order to do that filtering process it requires dopamine so dopamine is one of our um, neurochemicals in the body um, that uh, we typically think of as our reward chemical, right? You get a dopamine hit from a hug or from a bar of chocolate or something, um, but it has other functions in the body. So one of them is to get absorbed into the thalamus to help us dial down the noise. So on the surface of the thalamus, you have little receptors that can soak up dopamine to do that job. What this study showed was that creative people have fewer receptors for dopamine on the thalamus. So in layman's terms, I say we're less able to filter the crazy, right? So if you're like me and you're sitting in a noisy restaurant, for instance, and you're trying to hold a conversation with someone, but you're listening to the music that's playing, you're listening to the conversation at that table, you're smelling the food, and then the waiter comes and you're and there's all this stimulation going on, and you find it very hard to just kind of focus on the person in front of you. That's a lack of filtration that is common to so many creative people. What this can also show us is that when we need our world to go narrow, say you've done a big performance and you're hyper stimulated and now you come off stage and you just want the world to just go quiet. I just need to sit quietly here. We need dopamine for that. We're not very good as we've seen at being able to absorb it. So we might find ourselves reaching for external sources of dopamine. So things like alcohol and drugs give us a dopamine hit. So that might explain the fact that in the creative um, kind of uh, professions, there is um, anecdotal and uh, research literature that shows we have a greater um, uh, prevalence of addiction in our population. So this may be one of the reasons why biologically we're, we're essentially dopamine hungry. So we look for it from outside of ourselves. Okay, so what can also happen with, with dopamine is that we have, dopamine not often has a sort of cyclical um, release in the system. So we kind of go through little peaks and troughs. And for most people, it's quite a little gentle, lilting wave of dopamine expression in the body. 
what's been shown is that in creative people, we tend to have peaks and troughs and peaks and troughs. So we're up, we're down, we're up, we're down, we're manic, we're depressed, right? So this, this kind of volatility in emotional states can also be explained by dysregulation of the dopamine system. And some of the great composers, uh, we've got here Tchaikovsky and Mozart, but Beethoven, um, Liszt, Schumann, were all documented to have uh, mental health challenges, and, and in particular, this melancholic depression or manic depression. And what research has shown is that when you look at the peaks and troughs of their emotional state through their own diaries, journal entries, and also the medical notes from their physicians, those can actually be very well correlated to the, exp the areas when they had their proliferation of um, composing their great works. So essentially, they might be in this sort of dark state where life really is not worth living, and that's being recorded in their journals and by their medical practitioners. And then naturally, you start this upswing of dopamine because it's always going to be cyclical. And as they're on that upswing, this is when their proliferative periods kick in. This is when they're writing all their stuff and everything's great. And then they reach that peak where the piece is done and then it's being performed and they're in this euphoric state and everything's wonderful. And then we start to slide down the, the other side of the curve and start, things start to get darker again and, and, and on we go. So whilst this explains a little bit of this up and down um, emotional state. What it also shows is that the lower states, the lower moods, are actually the fertile soil for the next burst of creative expression. And in fact, if you didn't have those dark times, you're less likely to get the kind of burst of inspiration. And this is sort of borne out by people who actually take medication to kind of flatten out that curve, to try and make their moods more steady state. What they also report is that they lose their creativity. They lose their inspiration. And that's not to say that you shouldn't be taking medication if that's been prescribed for you. But it's, again, just to explain the biology underneath this so we can understand this. When we understand something, we can, we can make choices that are informed about how we deal with these things. So this idea of increased sensory information getting into our brains also relates to the concept of pain. So artists are often um, known to be, um, to have quite a high experience of pain. So this hypersensitivity also leads to increased pain perception. It often leads to anxiety, which further drives the pain response. We feel more pain when we're anxious. It also increases inflammation in the body. So again, this idea that there's, you know, oh, they've always got something wrong with them. You know, <laughs> They're always in pain over something. Um, again, this is a biological part of this creative uh, biology. Perfectionism is another thing that we tend to uh, correlate with the creative process. And, you know, there's always this argument, is it an asset or is it a liability? Yes, we've got to be able to drive ourselves towards uh, achieving a goal, particularly in a highly competitive industry. But we can also end up in destructive processes. And it really comes down to whether you're motivating yourself by enthusiasm and joy for what you do, or whether you're motivating yourself by a fear of failure or trying to seek some reward. So you're either seeking reward or avoiding punishment. And this comes down to how we motivate ourselves. And there are two types of motivation, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. So intrinsic is, I want to do this because I absolutely love it and it brings me joy and I don't really care if I mess up. That's fine. I can I can uh, let myself go on that one. Extrinsic motivation is this more carrot and stick approach where you're chasing some reward. I want my teacher to say I'm good at it. I want my audience to applaud. I want the director to hire me again. So this people pleasing kind of approach or I'm terrified of doing it wrong. So I'm going to push myself to be perfect so that I avoid failure. So that 
version of events is a lot more biologically costly because it's it's driven by a stress response, right? That's going to have a cost to our health versus the intrinsic side, which is a more self-reciprocating, self-energizing way of being in the world. We also need to look at the concept of identity with creative people because there is a tendency to identify yourself by what you do rather than by who you are. I'm a musician, I'm a dancer. No, that's what you do, it's not who you are. And we have something called this wheel of life where these are all kind of aspects of someone's life and they're like pies on a, or, or slices of pie in a, in a, uh, a big cake. And each of those should have a different color to it. Um, but if you are a creative person, let's say you're a dancer and you look at this chart in, in the, with the view of I am a dancer and that's who I am, fun and recreation. Oh, well, I go to my dance classes. That's what I love to do. Career. I want to be a dancer in my career. Health. Oh, well, I've got this injury I got from dancing right now. Personal development. Oh, I trained as a dancer all through my childhood. And so I'm all about developing myself as a dancer. Friends and family. Well, the only friends I have are dancers because I spend all my time dancing and my family spend all their time driving me to my dance lessons. Environment. I spend my time in dance studios. Uh, finances. I want to earn my money by being a dancer. Romance, significant other. Well, I never meet anyone other than dancers. So my partner is also a dancer. So we start to see that that whole wheel becomes one color. So if I then say to you, okay, as of tomorrow, dance career is off the table for you for whatever reason, who are you, okay? That's a precarious place to live and it can drive that fear of failure we just talked about. So that kind of leads us to also creativity and dis-ease, things that go wrong in the body, health outcomes. Because if we are in this stress state, st stressed state, so if you are a perfectionist, that's stressful. If you are in this kind of hypersensitized state of being a creative person, it's stressful. It drives the stress response in the body. And there's this highly complicated word here that basically just describes the fact that our emotions, our psychological expressions, lead to neurological signals, which is the nervous system, electrical signaling, that drives our immune system. So our immune system is our defense system. When you are in a state of stress, you're essentially in a state of defense. You're trying to protect yourself. So the immune system comes online. That drives inflammation and, and uh, other things, drives the pain response. The endocrine system, this is our hormonal system, and the hormones are also chemical messengers. So when there's a stress response detected by the brain, it's going to send all these signals out, and the endocrine system is going to um, get the hormones online. That includes, includes adrenaline, right? So the signal of a stress state chemically. So if we're living in this hyper stress state with all these systems online all the time, they're in defense mode, which means they're not in repair mode. So our body needs to spend a good majority of its time in repair and maintenance work. When we're in defense, none of that's going on. We're not getting the housekeeping done. So things are going to start to go wrong in the body. And I get into more detail with that in the full length version of this talk. But just to connect there the dots between creativity as this kind of externally viewed idea of an artist and what the biology underneath is actually doing, how it's predicting creative behaviors and also how it's affecting health. Now, I don't want to leave you with the idea that Creativity is a disease. Of course, it's not. Creativity is fabulous. It's, it's, it's the medicine for society, right? What would the world be without music and dance and theater and all these things? So what we're looking at here is understanding the tools that we have, understanding uh, how the creativity system works in the body so that we can harness it to our advantage and avoid some of the pitfalls that it might pull us into. So if this has whetted your appetite to know more about this, I do have a full length talk on this. So check that out. But in the meantime, go and find some nice downtime and rest time for that body.